Charles Manson is synonymous with some of the most horrific crimes in American history. However, there was a time when the celebrity cult leader struck up a friendship with the Beach Boys' very own Dennis Wilson. The two even worked on music together before Manson took a darker path. Here's a look inside their strange yet fascinating relationship that ended with a Manson song that the Beach Boys took on. Cult leader and killer Charles Manson and Beach Boy drummer and surfer Dennis Wilson were friends, for a while at least. Good enough friends that Manson and his family of young women lived with Wilson for several months. In the late 1960s, it was probably not a good idea to hang around with Charles Manson. Dennis Wilson didn't know that, but nobody did, at least not the way we know today. Dennis Wilson, brother of Brian Wilson, was a co-founder of the Beach Boys. Charles Manson, on the other hand, is perhaps the most famous, certainly the most infamous, cult leader in American history. On his orders, Manson's followers, the Manson family as they were known, carried out the Tate LaBianca murders in 1969, leaving seven people dead, including actress Sharon Tate. The group's goal was to realize Manson's apocalyptic vision of a massive race war, a scenario he described as Helter Skelter. We're aware of all of this today, but back in the spring of 1968, when Dennis Wilson let the Manson family into his life and his home, the group's darkest deeds were still a year off. While living with Dennis Wilson, Charles Manson and his swarm of STD-infested scavengers relentlessly took advantage of Wilson's kindness. They destroyed his home, his cars, and his credit. Wilson, who died in 1983 after a long struggle with addiction, never recovered from his time spent living with the family and blamed himself for the deaths that occurred after the Manson family moved from his home in the Palisades to the emptiness of Spahn Ranch. Dennis Wilson may never have met Charles Manson if he hadn't been so prone to picking up hitchhikers, especially young female hitchhikers. In the spring of 1968, Wilson saw Patricia Krenwinkel and Ella Jo Bailey thumbing it on the side of the road and brought them home for milk and cookies. This act of kindness turned his life upside down. He offered to drive them home. Along the way, the women told Wilson that this man they were living with, a musician named Charlie, was their spiritual guru. Wilson, seemingly lost amid an ugly divorce and the trappings of fame, wanted to meet him. The girls returned to Wilson's rented home in the Pacific Palisades and when he left to record tracks with the Beach Boys, they never left. When he returned, he found a party in full swing and a bearded, dirty stranger waiting for him in the driveway. The man was Charles Manson. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to remember this if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to stay updated on all of our latest content. In order to make Wilson feel comfortable, he supposedly got on his knees and kissed the drummer's feet. Wilson spent the rest of 1968 partying with the freeloading Manson family. In Mike Love's memoir, Good Vibrations, he writes that Dennis was all too happy to allow Manson and his girls to move in, use his charge cards, take his clothes, eat his food, even drive his Mercedes. Manson, after all, had something for Dennis, a stable of young women who catered to his every desire. Because he was blinded by the young women who swarmed about Manson, Wilson didn't care that the family was slowly eroding his life and his possessions like rats in the wall of a decaying home. The family didn't respect or care for any of Wilson's possessions, so it's no surprise that they totaled his uninsured Mercedes. But that's not the worst of it. The Wilson brothers loved their Ferrari 275 GTBs, both Brian and Dennis owned one. Manson family members borrowed Brian's and crashed it. Later, they also managed to wreck Dennis Wilson's Ferrari 275 GTB while driving around downtown LA. While living with Wilson throughout 1968, the family took full advantage of their plush and undeserved digs. Everything the family bought during their stay with Wilson was paid for by the Beach Boy. 
They racked up huge bills on the drummer's credit cards. The family even ran up an $800 tab at a local dairy in Wilson's name, which makes you wonder how much milk were these hippies actually drinking. Aside from sending Wilson into massive credit card debt, the family also took whatever they wanted from his house. His clothes, his gold records. If it wasn't nailed down, the family saw it as theirs for the taking. Around this time, Wilson started distancing himself from the cult leader and his family. But instead of asking them to leave, calling the police, or just throwing them out on the lawn by the scruff of the neck, he simply moved into another house. But Manson wouldn't be ignored. He left a note for Dennis at his new place that read, You can't get away from me. As if wrecking his cars and running up huge bills weren't bad enough, all of the group sex that the gang were engaging in took a turn for the worse, as it tends to. No one knows who the first member of the family was to contract gonorrhea, but whoever it was gave it to the rest of the girls, and one of the girls, or multiple girls, gave it to Wilson. The drummer did the only thing he could and took the whole family to get penicillin shots. Wilson claimed it was probably the largest gonorrhea bill in history, and his claim was later backed up in Rolling Stone by an anonymous member of the Beach Boys. Dennis ran up the gonorrhea bill the time the whole family got the clap. He took them to a Beverly Hills doctor. It took something like $1,000 in penicillin. As Manson and his cronies continued to destroy Wilson's life, they turned his home into a party palace and walked around like they owned the place. Wilson may have been partying hard in his home before he was entangled with the family, but Manson's parties were a different kind of fun. One member of the Beach Boys who spoke to Rolling Stone said, We've got several 8-track tapes of Charlie and the girls that Dennis cut, maybe even some 16-track. Maybe we'll put it out in the fall. Call it Death Row. Manson took Wilson's idyllic, never-ending summer and turned it dark. He corrupted it and made it nasty, a microcosm of what he would finally do to the 60s just a few months after Wilson finally parted ways with him. Manson got part of his wish to be a rock legend when the Beach Boys recorded a version of his song, Cease to Exist, but they did the opposite of everything he asked them to. They changed the music from its bluesy twang to a more refined pop sound. They changed the lyrics, they changed the title, and most heinous of all, in Manson's eyes, they changed the credit. Dennis Wilson was the sole writer credited for Never Learn Not To Love, and this sent Manson over the edge. One day in 1968, Manson walked up to Wilson holding a single bullet. When Wilson asked him what it was, Manson replied, It's a bullet. Every time you look at it, I want you to think how nice it is your kids are still safe. According to musician Van Dyke Parks, Wilson beat the snot out of Manson in front of a bunch of hip people. With his tail between his legs, Manson retreated to Spahn Ranch and began planning what would become the Tate LaBianca murders. Now it's time to hear from you. Do you have any recollection of this period in the late 60s where Charles Manson was associated with Dennis Wilson? Let us know in the comments below. Let us know your thoughts. And if you haven't already done so, click the bell icon to stay updated on all of our latest content.